Hey everybody, welcome. Today we have myself, Joe Kim, and Adam Telfer, and we are joined by Frederick Decom and Jordan Maynard from Manticore, the makers of the new player creator platform called Core. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Good morning. <laughs> so Good today morning. we'll be talking. Oh, sorry. Today we will be talking to Frederick and Jordan about Core, and more specifically, number one, the product vision; two, the target audience; three, business model; four key challenges and issues, and five, the current status and future roadmap. But before diving into all of that, I thought I'd start with our understanding of what Core is, just based upon some of the, the blogs and videos that we've watched. And it'd be great to kind of clarify any misunderstandings that we have. But from watching a, a lot of the videos, and especially the developer demo that came out last month, uh, and by the way, I'll put a link in the show notes to all the, the videos and, and the blog post in case anyone wants to go deeper. But just to kind of describe, you know, my understanding of what it is, I wanted to first start by kind of describing the, th that understanding. So first, high level, the platform seems to be a high fidelity Roblox. I think, Frederick, you described it as such in, in one of your videos. So both a creator platform to easily make games by people who have limited technical and coding capability. And it's also a game portal where all the games made with the platform are made available to the core players. So similar to Roblox. The creator platform has a WYSIWYG drag and drop creation system where you are able to take pre-built game templates, art assets, and other types of functional blocks and modify them. So it seems to be more of a template system, but with the ability to customize. And for further customization, it seems like you can code against the creator platform, similar to Roblox by using Lua, the scripting language. So to some degree, it's kind of like a, a, a Lego for games where, but the game primitives here are much more functional and higher level, but at the same time, templated. And currently you can build games using the core framework, which currently runs on PC only for now. Uh, it'd be great to uh, talk to you about what that roadmap looks like in terms of other platforms. And also core can currently publish out to PC only, although I know you guys have talked about a feature roadmap for mobile and console as well. The platform also abstracts the infrastructure in terms of server and game operations from the user and runs all that for the creators. So also similar to Roblox. And so that at a high level is kind of our understanding. And just based upon that understanding, wanted to talk about what we then would believe are the three key advantages and disadvantages and would be great to get your feedback on whether we've got the, these right or not. So in terms of the advantages, one would be that it allows non-devs and non-technical people to create very high quality games and, and also very quickly. Two is that core manages all of the infrastructure for you, the live ops and, and all the service and all that kind of stuff. And three, core includes lots of assets so you can literally build whatever game you'd like without having to create external assets. So from a cost perspective and speed perspective, that's very efficient. Now, on the flip side, the top three disadvantages uh, we would interpret as following. First, it would be harder to differentiate your game from others, from the templated functionality to the fact that all the shared assets are, will be, use, be available to anyone in the, uh, using the platform. And currently, it also seems like you can't import assets into, uh, you know, in, into the system as well. Secondly, uh, in, in terms of the monetization and revenue models, so developers jumping on are sort of betting on the future growth of the platform and for a revenue model to emerge. But, you know, so Roblox has been around for a long time, so it's been able to build a huge user base. But in this case, it would seem like developers would be betting that this becomes the next big thing and the revenue model emerges. And third, uh, you know, in terms of like the app space or other spaces, developers would have more control over marketing and distribution. And so here, you're not in control of the distribution and marketing for the game. And so it's not like, you know, if you have a mobile app and you can like spend, uh, spend marketing dollars and try to promote your app here, you'd be kind of at the control of the, the e ecosystem. So with that, uh, and that was pretty long winded. So apologies for that. But let's stop here. And Frederick and Jordan, could you talk to us about whether 
our understanding of the platform is correct and whether you would agree or disagree with the advantages and disadvantages outlined. Right, right. Uh, thank you. So that's, uh, I'm Frederick, the guy with the French accent, the CEO of Manticore Games, and the guy with the, the, the regular Californian accent, American accent is Jordan, our Chief Creative Officer and Co-Founder of Manticore Games. Uh, yeah, so it's a fully loaded intro, lots of lots of points you touch upon. I think there are a couple of things I want to say, uh, maybe starting at a super high level and then going into all the details you mentioned. Uh, I think, you, you know, as you highlighted, Core is a fairly uh, complex uh, 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 platform, right? It's, 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 it has two sides, right? There's a side for the creators and a side for the players. So it's a two-sided marketplace at a high level. Our ambition is really to make uh, creating games uh, much, much easier than it is currently. As you know, currently making games is extremely hard. The pipeline involves you know, sometimes a dozen tools, uh, the mastery of all these tools, plus the backend servers, the multiplayer code, the publishing, the, the business aspects, so on and so forth. So Core is really a, a one-stop shop for all that. Instead of using multiple tools, you use just, just one. It's not just a tool, it's also a service platform as, as you highlighted. So um, there are lots of analogies you use. They are not all wrong. I think they are all partly true uh, regarding other platforms. Um, you know, I think the, the, the key differentiators and some you highlighted very well are, you know, one, you know, the, the, the graphics, the high-end graphics, the high fidelity of the graphics, the high fidelity of the gameplay. Um, all that comes baked in, right? Whether you want to make a, a single player game or real-time multiplayer game, uh, an MMO, first-person shooter, third-person shooter, everything comes baked in. Uh, uh, in, in core. So by default, de facto, out of the box, you get real-time multiplayer. Uh, you get the servers, as you mentioned, you get like, you, all that is transparent. You don't have to worry about knowing about the client server architecture, about scaling, about understanding what to deploy, how to deploy, all that is fully baked in, right? Um, and so for us, that was very, very important because we see so many studios struggling financially. 90% of studios constantly struggle financially. And one of the reasons is because uh, it's so hard to make games. It's so costly. It's so uh, you need such a high technical expertise. Um, the other thing you mentioned, you know, is is uh, so the graphics and the fidelity of the the graphics and the gameplay. That's super important to us. The fact that when we play, because we we come from that world of MMOs, first person shooters, third person shooters, as players and as game makers, the code, the multiplayer code, has to be perfect. Everything has to be perfect. Um, you know, another key differentiator that 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 you mentioned mention is, is um you know, the fact that you have all that in one platform, it's, it's hard to understate. Uh, the fact that the analogy you didn't use, but that we use often and that we are, um, um, uh, that are mentioned about Core is the similarity between almost YouTube and Twitch in terms of the creation, in terms of the usage, in terms of the fact that it's going to unleash lots of creativity in gaming that is not present today. Gaming today is reserved for a certain group of people who have access to the tech, the funding, etc. With Core, it's much more open. Almost anybody in the world can make games, and we already have examples of people in very far away places that typically are not represented in gaming, making games in core. Um, so that's, that's a, 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 I think, where, where I would start. And the analogy of Twitch and YouTube, again, to, to be clear, is, is from a, a, a player's perspective in terms of consumption. You can go from one game to another in just a matter of seconds, or it can be a game, it can be a world, it can be a scene, it can be a story, just like you would on YouTube or Twitch. And for the creators, it's also the, the, the analogy with this platform is because, you know, it's super easy to create, to remix, to publish, to share, to collaborate, and of course, in turn, to find your audience, right? Um, so that's where I would start, and I don't know if Jordan has probably some stuff to add on the technical side. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I'm Jordan, Jordan maybe, creative maybe, officer. Uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but do you, uh, in terms of the advantages and dis disadvantages, would you guys agree or disagree with that? Or w was there anything wrong in terms of like our understanding? Yeah, it's a good question. And I, I was going to talk about the, um, you know, the perceived disadvantages actually, I think, in some ways become advantages. Uh, okay. So for instance, the fact that, uh, you know, you mentioned that right now you're not allowed to, to bring external models into core, you use all the models yeah. that we provide, that actually turns out to be an advantage in a number of ways, we, we don't find that it limits the creators create that actually, I think, sort of um, enhances the creators creativity of what they can make with those pieces, we allow you to kit bash things together, um, such that you can make 
take all styles of games. We have examples of cartoony games uh, and examples of, of sort of horror sci-fi games made with those same pieces. Uh, it also on the technical side makes it so for the consumer, for the player, the game downloads very fast because all the heavyweight assets are already on the user's computer. So they don't have to download all the models for each individual game. All they download for each individual game is a very, very small definition file that's like a couple hundred K. So that's why in the trailer, you see people jumping from game to game to the portals. It actually is almost that fast. You can jump from game to game with your friends that quickly. So it's, you know, there's, um, and on the, you know, for the example, for the marketing, the perceived sort of downside of the, the, the player is in control of the marketing. I would actually argue that, you know, discoverability on the app stores, the various app stores is, is difficult, right? I think on core, you have not only a level playing field, but you actually have just a link that is, if someone has core installed and you pass them that link in discord, or you pass them that link on Slack, they click on it. They actually jump into a multiplayer instance instantaneously uh, from that game. So I think it's actually almost easier to market because all you have to do is put your link in discord and people can join your game. One thing that's very important also is that this idea that, you know, in the traditional in the current traditional uh, game development world, it takes like big teams, lots of time, lots of money sometimes to make almost any games, even indie games. With score, you can be one person, you can be two people, three people, and you can do amazing things, right? We've, we've seen people who are just back-end engineers, just UI UX artists, uh, UI, UI, UI UX artists make full games on their own, which in the traditional game development world is almost impossible, except if they have team, time, and money, right? So yeah, let's move forward in terms of talking about the games that this platform can actually create. So I took a look at the video and I was actually very impressed with um, the technology and how, um, or what types of games you can actually build with this, right? Like it, especially going on that idea that the product vision is to kind of build a more in-depth, higher fidelity Roblox. I think you guys have executed on that very well. Um, looking through the videos, what I was probably most excited about was the shooter aspect. Um, was that a lot of the games that you guys were sh highlighting were um, shooter style modes and I could see the next Brendan Green, the next kind of like PUBG being built within this engine, right? Um, but in terms of the breadth of different types of game experiences, you kind of highlighted that you've seen a lot of different games get created. Um, but in terms of the breadth, like what, what types of games do you see players actually highly engaging in so far? and which modes or which types of games do you think you're gonna be leaning into to kind of drive your audience? Um, th th there are a couple of things, right? So obviously, you know, you have all the materials we put out like a, a, a month, a month and a half ago. And, um, you know, and, and the, the community, the, the content has evolved already quite a bit, right? We have like all sorts of games on the platform already. Um, one of the reasons, uh, you know, we, we uh, leaned into uh, real-time multiplayer early on is because this is the hardest types of games to make technically, right? I'm not talking creatively, I'm not talking commercially, those are different layers, but from a technical perspective, um, you know, uh, uh, making real-time multiplayer games, especially uh, shooters, is, is, is very, very hard, right? Because everything has to be perfect, it has to be perfect, it has to be uh, predictable you have to have like all, all sorts of you know causality baked in you know it has to be uh, p uh perfect under probably 60 milliseconds some people would say under 200 milliseconds but as a as a uh, a first person shooter fan i know it's you know under 80 milliseconds i get really stressed and uh, you know even 60 milliseconds right um so we decided to have you know the the the, the very best uh, multiplayer code layer we could build right for real uh, for first person shooters third person shooters mmos etc like because uh, uh, that's something we've done multiple times in the past right our team has worked on mmos first person shooters third person shooters and everything has to be you know absolutely perfect so we decided to lean into that but then as you know from a technical perspective from a game design perspective there is really almost no difference between a real time multiplayer game and an listen and asynchronous uh, 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 multiplayer game so after that it's up to the the creators, right, to use the multiplayer code or not in their design. But, um, you know, I, I talk to studios all the time, right, and we've all worked on multiple types of games, and th there are studios to this day that avoid real-time multiplayer, not because they don't want to do it, but it's just they know they cannot do it. Uh, it's a technical 
hill that they don't want to climb. They want to spend their 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 uh, points, their 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 money, their efforts on other aspects of game development, not necessarily the real. So it's all fully baked in, um, you know, uh, in the platform. So just out of the box, you get like a real time multiplayer whether you decide to use it for, for shooting, for fighting, or, or, or whatnot, right? Um, so and, I'm just speaking to the types of games that are already on the platform. Um, where are you guys seeing engagement concentrate? Because like when I look at something like Roblox, um, engagement tends to concentrate a lot around a lot of those top popular games. So welcome to Bloxville and what's the other one? The, uh, the Adopt Me types of games, right? Like games versus YouTube has a very different kind of engagement um, pattern. Um, so with Manticore, what are you guys seeing at least so far? And I realize it's very early on the platform in terms of concentration of engagement. Yeah, so uh, like you said, it is very early in the platform, but we have seen some interesting um, sort of developments from from our creators and sort of trends. And so obviously there's a lot of games that are created on the platform that are, that are made from our template system, like you said, that are very easy to create and shooters and stuff. But very quickly, we also saw creators doing stuff that we never expected. And it's gotten to the point where, you know, if somebody asks, is X possible on core or is Y possible on core? I used to say, oh, no, not yet, or maybe you can do that in the future. But now I say, I don't know, like a creator might be able to do that. Like uh, we've had people make their own player pianos in core, for instance, that uh, it plays a MIDI file by parsing the MIDI itself in, in Lua. Um, so there's really interesting um, sort of genres that are coming out. And what's really cool is because creators can share their stuff in the community content. We can talk about what community content means later and how it's different from a store and a marketplace uh, later in the conversation. But because creators can share their stuff, if one person decides to write a player piano and put it on community content, every game can, from now on can have a, a player piano in it, if that makes sense. So you really sort of see this explosion of content that gets put in. As an example, I don't know if you remember the... Um, uh, a few months ago, somebody duct taped a banana to a wall as an art piece in Southern California, and then somebody ate the, the banana. Uh, one, of our, um, one of our community relations people made a duct tape banana in core, and all of our creators were putting it and hiding it in their game as an Easter egg, like literally that same day that that news story happened. Um, so I think it's really, you've never seen that possible in games before because, you know, a traditional game takes, you know, a year to make. By the time you try to do a meme, it's sort of out of date. Um, moving on in terms of the... Um, product strategy with when comparing it actually to Roblox and you talked a lot about like all the different types of games you can create like of course like when you compare some of these feature sets to Roblox um, they do include things like massive multiplayer right um, right out of box uh, of course their visual fidelity is much lower but overall they do hit a lot of those feature sets so what building blocks are you guys um, really leaning into to help differentiate the types of games that are created on this platform versus something like Roblox? Yeah, I can address that for sure. So it's a great question. And, um, you know, like Frederick said at the beginning, we really sort of, we come from obviously AAA, hardcore uh, gaming, multiplayer gaming, and we really care about the fidelity, the gameplay fidelity. Obviously the graphics fidelity is very high in core. Um, so, you know, the other thing I think is the ease of use and the ease of publishing. And we've really sort of been able to build core from the ground up. We've built our own complete game editor package from the ground up to allow people to make games. The other cool thing is that the editor package and the client game package are the same piece of software. So you don't need to launch another piece of software. You don't need to learn anything else. You can just like with the game, the same client that plays the game is anyone who's a player has the opportunity to be also a creator on the platform, which I think is slightly different from some of the other platforms. Um, you know, th there's a lot of, you know, whether we talk about Roblox or Dreams or even Unity uh, or things like that, I think there's a lot of sort of uniqueness in, in core that I, okay, I've been making games for 25 years. I started off making games on, for the Super Nintendo, right? And I've used every commercial and every proprietary engine under the sun in that 25 years. And using core feels like almost magic to me. Like I, I'm still sort of amazed every time I go and, and use it. The, it, the, ease of iteration, the ease of publishing, it can't be overstated. The fact that, and later, if we do a demo for you, uh, we do a demo on video, I can show you that within five minutes, we can create a multiplayer game and have multiple people playing it and published uh, from the get-go. Yeah, so it's, it's mainly around like ease of use, especially for these creators. Um, and like right now you're a PC-centric editor. Um, is there ideas to, on 
uh, I'm assuming on the play side, you're assuming you're going to be able to move to say console, maybe mobile, but on the editor side, are you also thinking like dreams or, or like Roblox where you'll have some mobile so editing? Edit, editor will likely be on the PC for a while. We might add a uh, console access at some point for sure uh, for, for, for the creators, right? Um, and then for the players, it's a PC, uh, it's going to be mobile, console, etc. Uh, we're also looking at, you know, the, some of the streaming solutions. Uh, we see all, all that is going to be fairly easy. You know, we, we, we also built on top of Unreal. So we benefit from uh, lots of the great things that, that they've been working on, especially after having Fortnite that they've reintegrated into Unreal. Um, and one last question on, on this. Uh, in terms of the technical limits of the platform, um, do you guys have any sort of limits within each game in terms of CCU or number of players or squad account or this type of thing? Yeah, I, I can talk about that a little bit. Um, one of the cool things about, uh, yeah, so core, um, you can have right now up to 16 players concurrent in, in an instance of a game. Uh, we're going to expand that to 32 and hopefully later uh, more. But if, if you're the 17th person to join a particular game, it'll spin up a new instance automatically. So there'll always be bandwidth for you to join a game. You'll never be capped uh, and have to wait in a queue or anything like that. The servers spin up in a matter of like five seconds for a new game. Um, uh, and just to kind of go further in terms of the technical limitations, are there specific like, like for different kinds of multiplayer games, because as Frederick mentioned, you guys are really focusing on multiplayer. I would assume that the architecture required to support a, you know, uh, like a shooter, which has very low latency requirements and has synchronization issues relative to a game like a Clash Royale would be very different. So how do you manage these different kinds of games? Yeah. Is it with the same architecture? Yes. Or is it it's very, very. It's a very good question. Um, so, so as I mentioned before, like I think technically the hardest types of games to make are the real-time multiplayer games where you have like super fast-paced action. You, it has to be deterministic. It has to be uh, not, not only the client on the server have to be always in accord and, and know what every, everyone is thinking, but also you know you have to have predictability, deterministic. It has to be deterministic within within a few seconds, so on and so forth. So you all understand. So that's really the hardest uh, the hardest uh, type of game. So we've made that uh, possible on core. After that. You can reuse that. You can detune it, right? Like for instance, uh, a battle royale, uh, a, a, a Clash Royale type game. Uh, it is real time, but it's not like you're playing Valorant or CS or uh, Apex, right? Um, uh, it, it's slightly different, the, 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 but, but it's, it's somewhat similar. The architecture is very, very similar uh, in, in many ways. I've said it's really how you use it. I mean, again, there are some people who've made like non-multiplayer games. Uh, people have made stuff that are not even games. They are more like scenes and worlds. And we have people who've made uh, all sorts of multiplayer games, shooters, battlers. Yeah, but what you're uh, saying, Frederick, though, is underneath the hood in terms of the, the architecture and the approach, whether it's like uh, for the network sync, for example, whether it's like lockstep or MMO style, like, uh, you know, state sync or a hybrid like Overwatch uses, whatever mm -hmm. that is, it's generalized across whatever type of multiplayer game it is. Is that, is that right? That is correct. We solved for the hardest problem first, uh, which is the real-time, you know, synchronous multiplayer games, obviously, and everything else is sort of a subset of that. You can make, like Frederick said, you can make a single-player game. That's a subset of multiplayer. It's just player count is one, uh, and it and um, you can also do turn-based. You know, everything like that uh, is possible within Core. We wanted to solve for the hardest problem, uh, you know, first and foremost. So we and then everything else became easy after that. Yeah. And for now, for now, the CCU, like we, we can have 16 players, right? Soon we'll have 32 and likely more later. If I say more, my CTO is going to call me like within five minutes and say, don't, don't over promise. But uh, we, we have a super strong team, right? It's like a team that has worked on all sorts of super complicated games. Our CTO has 25 years of experience in gaming. The average number of years of experience in gaming on the team is still around like 15, 16, even though we've had lots of more junior people recently. So, um, you know, the, the other thing is for us, it's all a lot about uh, the, 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 the creators and the players, giving them the best experience. And, um, you know, there are so many, many, many games where you don't have 2,000 people on a server. Sometimes you don't even have 100 people on the, on the server. So uh, even with, with 16 or 32 players concurrently, like you, the, the, the combination of the combinatorials of, of, of games that you can make that are fun is, is already pretty infinite, right? Um, Okay, so just kind of moving forward and uh, talking about product vision, 
So I thought it'd be instructive to have you guys clarify for us what you guys thought in terms of the product vision, in terms of like, what is the ultimate goal here? Is it building a Roblox for an older audience, both player and developer, or is it some kind of more grandiose metaverse uh, vision? Like maybe we could kind of understand from your perspective, what, what is the, the ultimate end goal from a product vision perspective? Yeah, I think it's it's somewhat all of the above, right? Um, and um, you know, and more, and more. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, but let me uh, yeah, let me actually just yeah. jump in. Real, yeah, is it okay. So, um, so it's a really great question. I think the overall product vision is to really sort of radical accessibility and inclusivity in gaming, right? I, I want core to be the way, almost the way, like you can imagine in five years, core could be the way that games are made. And it seems almost archaic that you would have done it any other way in the past. Just like how today we don't program games in assembly language anymore. And if you tried to, if you thought about programming a game in assembly language, people would think you're crazy. In five or 10 years, people might say, oh wait, people used to use multiple pipelines and they had to have build processes and all stuff that seems archaic that seems crazy i can just publish a game like you can publish a video right now on youtube you don't have to go to a studio you don't have to you know have a contract with a network anymore to make videos um so when i look at the space in terms of creative sandbox games um like dreams as you talked about just came out uh, locked on the ps4 um and overall the performance was pretty poor they haven't really been able to get to a critical mass of players uh, but that's initial numbers. And you look at Roblox and of course, like is a amazing success um, going shooting up into the right in terms of their graph. Um, but when you look at the initial, right, like 2006 to 2014 almost, um, they're really, really struggling to get that critical mass of audience. So when you guys are looking at this creative sandbox space, um, what are you looking at in terms of that initial time frame and like, is there anything as a part of your strategy to kind of speed up that critical mass uh, phase? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, you, 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 you're after, you know, listening to your podcast and watching your videos, et cetera, I'm going to use some terms that are probably more strategic, business, technical, but I think you can handle them, right? Basically, we're operating a two-sided marketplace, right? You have the, the, the supply side, the creators, you have the demand side, the players, and, uh, and you have kind of the platform and the content in the middle um, with collaboration, with, with, with publishing, so on and so forth. Uh, you know, so we're obviously looking at creating a flywheel effect, right? The, 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 the creators make content, the content attract players, and the players then uh, give us uh, all engagement and, 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 uh, and time and money, and then we repurpose that in the platform by getting more creators, etc. So, um, you know, and, and, and so, you, and you mentioned also earlier, like, hey, you know, the, 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 the promise for a creator is you join the, pl the platform early before it's fully baked, fully defined, and, and before it starts taking off. And that's one of the big promises, right? Uh, so we are doing all that, right? We are not just focusing on one side or the other. For now, we are focusing a lot on the creators because it's critical, right? We want to have uh, creators uh, 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 joining us, uh, whether they are new creators, people who use Unity, people who use Roblox, uh, uh, so on and so forth, people who do game jams. Um, and then we want them to get familiar with the platform, start creating, start collaborating with other people. Uh, very soon we'll have the, 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 the monetization part for the creators in place. Uh, I'm not gonna give you the exact timeline, but it's not, it's soon. You know, some people have seen what we've done and they say, oh, you've done your closed alpha uh, and then your open alpha. So you're launching in 21, 22, right? It's like, no, we're launching this year. <laughs> uh, and so uh, it's piece by piece, right? And then um, you try to place some, some efforts on all sides of the funnel. For now, again, it's all the creators because you know, we want them to get familiar with the platform, collaborate, meet other people, start experimenting. We have tons of schools and students and game jams that are adopting core as part of their curriculum. Uh, we have indie developers, we have uh, all sorts of creators joining the platform. Then they're gonna collaborate, make content. And we've been pretty upfront. If you've seen the, 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 the blog post and the, the AMA we did a few weeks ago about the roadmap and the monetization about how, how it's gonna play out and how the monetization is gonna be structured at first. And in a few 
weeks, few months, we're going to start reaching out more toward the players. Uh, we see it's a different messaging, right? It's a different messaging. Um, and the target audience for the creators is pretty broad, right? It can be any creators, like people like Jordan with 25 years of experience in gaming, as well as a 14-year-old girl in, in Belgium or Africa or South, South America who has a genius game idea, right? Or 20-something in, in the Reunion Island. Uh, and then for the players, you know, we'll see, right, what is the target audience, but it, it could be also pretty broad. We're also investing in, um, in our ecosystem, right, training the creators and building incentives. We have uh, tons of events and contests, uh, game jams, etc. Uh, coming up uh, in the next weeks. It's going to be a very, very busy uh, late spring on summer uh, in the community of core, in the core community for, for creators and then at some point, of course, for players. So we have all sorts of game jams and contests. Uh, I don't think I can reveal most of them yet, but it's going to be pretty exciting. Uh, we have also all sorts of uh, externship programs at play where we're going to invite people who you know, are not able to do their internships because of coronavirus and to come on and do stuff in core and be trained in game creation. Uh, but you're right, right? You, you, you took a, it, it, it's, it's one thing where you need to have, I think, patience. Patience doesn't mean you don't do anything. You try to you know, place some bets all along this flywheel and see what happens try to get the flywheel started, I guess for you would be that way. Uh, and then I think, you know, we look back in a year and we see, oh, uh, 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 probably we were right on, 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 on placing bets in certain areas and probably we didn't know, right? In some other cases, some things are gonna work, some things are not gonna work. Um, and, and we will always be surprised, I think, of, of what will make the success of the platform, just like Roblox was, just like YouTube was, just like Twitch was, right? Um, so it's it's going to be a mix of all that. Uh, I know it sounds like a. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but Frederick, what, who do you think is your beachhead? Like, is it sort of like the the kids that are developing on Roblox that kind of age out and then go to your platform? Is it small indie, de you know, devs? Like, who are the, or is it artists that you know always wanted to make a game? Like, who do you think are your initial initial creators? Well, for now, we have all of those, right? We even have, um, I would say, more like AAA-ish game studios experimenting on core to do prototyping. Uh, but we have literally like everything from like 14-year-olds that are, have no experience in gaming uh, all the way to pretty advanced indies uh, using the platform, um, you know, it, it, it's we, we we've been seeing lots of lots of good results. I would say with with schools, with students, with aspiring game creators, because um, again, there is a um, almost an I wouldn't say anti-establishment, but there is like the, you know, as you know, the traditional path to get into gaming is really really hard. I mean. <laughs> you know, we all got breaks to get into gaming besides Jordan being born into gaming because his dad was uh, one of the early employees at, at EA. So he had it easy. But, you know, for the average person who wants to get into gaming, it's almost impossible, right? You know that, right? He, he, the, the Frederick, the kid Frederick who was in this small town in France back in 20, 30 years ago, his chances of getting into gaming were close to zero. Well, so we're seeing lots of lots of promises with, with, with people being at school and saying, hey, I've been learning to use all these tools, this plethora of tools to make a game. And I've been asked to specialize arts, game design, production, engineering. And all of a sudden there is score and maybe I should drop out of school, right? So we've seen lots of lots of progress there and, and also lots of innovation. Like some of the games we've seen like are, are made by these people who have not been, I would say, trained or, or, or tented or, or whatever you want to use, uh, formatted by traditional game development and therefore they just make stuff that sometimes early on don't make sense just like on youtube just like on twitch right i mean we're all watching videos that shouldn't really make any sense but <laughs> you are with a million followers right i think another great target beachhead for us is also mod makers um you know the mod scene right. is something where a lot of of innovation and genres have sprung out of obviously famously you know the entire moba genre now the entire battle royale genre has sprung out of originally the mod scenes but getting those uh, mods to commercial success in the past has been very hard right like it's taken 10 plus years in some cases to get a mod that was you know very fun and innovative 
to commercial success. And so we think with core, the, with the sort of speed of iteration and the speed of publishing, uh, that could be a much shorter timeline. Got it. Okay. So just kind of shifting now to business model, this is, you know, kind of the topic that a lot of our audience is the most interested in, in terms of monetization. I know you guys have touched upon it with one of your blog posts, but just for our audience, could you tell us what is the kind of thinking in terms of business model, both for Manticore, for you guys, and then for your developers? Is it going to be more like a Roblox kind of fund, or is it going to be something else? Uh, how does it work? It's actually very simple, right? So the money comes from the players. Uh, it's a free-to-play experience for the players, just like any game, just like Apex, uh, Fortnite, etc. They come, uh, they play, they can play endlessly for free, obviously. And then they have access to different programs, different cosmetics, right? Uh, we have a very deep, beautiful avatar system. Uh, every time we show the platform to people. Uh, actually, that's what Jordan is showing. Like, people are really super excited about the the, the quality, the diversity, uh, the customization of the avatars, right? Uh, so, in some ways, it's like lots of the other top free to play uh, games out there. So, uh, cosmetics, right? You have access to cosmetics by by playing through progression and by by obviously paying. Um, we'll have avatars. We'll have all the sorts of looks, themes that you can combine. We combine any way you want, uh, backpacks, pets, mounts, you know, you name it, right? Uh, for the players, you also have access to all sorts of programs, right, that give you kind of VIP uh, select access to progression, cosmetics, events, right? So it's basically the, 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 the kind of battle pass, season pass model, uh, probably a little deeper than what you see out there without revealing uh, everything. But, uh, you know, you have battle passes, season passes, they give you access to certain progression, right? Certain uh, stats, certain cosmetics, but also events. Uh, that's a very important concept for us on the platform. I cannot talk too much about it yet, but you look at where I come from, you look at uh, what's already happening in the community for creators, look at the next weeks, we'll have tons of events for creators. Soon we'll extend that to players. So as a player, you can be part of different different groups, different systems, right? And so um, that is kind of the main uh, point of entry for, 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 for the money, for the, the economic influx, right? Uh, uh, cosmetics, micro subscriptions, subscriptions, etc. You'd have ways to also give uh, subscription money to the platform at the platform level, also at the creator level. So players can, just like on Twitch, YouTube, Patreon, etc., they can give money directly to the creators, they can subscribe to the creators, right? And then, of course, in turn, we share uh, uh, lots of that with the creators. Um, and the creators are going to be rewarded based on the popularity and the engagement of their games. Uh, uh, for, for, the first, for the first phase of the company, we're not really uh, going to allow creators to manage their own IAPs. We think they have already way too much on their plates in terms of managing their games. Um, that's one of the things actually, by the way, a little side, side note that we've been seeing is that you have people on the platform who you know, start making stuff and then people contact them and say, hey, what about this? What about that? Or, hey, I took your game and I, I, I changed it that way. Do you, wanna, do you mind like, do you like it? What do you think? So we want the creators to spend much more time on creativity with engaging their audience, uh, pleasing their audience, creating new content, as opposed to spending time reading all the books about monetization, IAPs, etc. So that's kind of the high level model, but our, 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 um, our goal is really to create a very strong economic platform for, for, for the creators, um, for them to make money, make a living, be incentivized to create the very best games and the very best expense for the players. You know, like, like Frederick said, I think the, the really cool part about this is that it's the incentives are aligned, right? Between, between Manticore, between the creators and between the players. If you think of a YouTube model where if you put a video on YouTube, YouTube shares a portion of their ad revenue with the highest engaging content. That's yeah. similar to what we will do. We'll share a portion of our revenue with the highest engaging content. And that really sort of aligns all incentives. Okay. Um, on the... Um, product vision. I just want to ask one more question. Um, the visual identity of this game, this was something that I think, Joe, you touched on in the podcast previously. Okay. Um, I, like when we look at the UI and we look at the game, um, it's, it's right, like very high fidelity Roblox, but it's easy to make the comparison to Fortnite, right? Especially when you're looking at the, the UI. 
um, um, right? Like, is this something that was kind of part of your product strategy to kind of like lean on stuff that players would know, or are you guys trying to figure out how to craft your own visual identity there? You know, when we started Manticore Games, actually, Core was not even our first idea. We actually started making AAA 3D uh, multiplayer games, and later that that sort of evolved into core and we could talk about that too if it was interesting but um our first game was going to be a game called spell shock that was sort of a modern interpretation of high fantasy uh real-time combat uh sort of a la wow uh battlegrounds if you you know if you had played some of the famous wow battlegrounds we really wanted to sort of do something like that as a standalone game would be cool and so the art style really started from there sort of imagining what maybe uh uh, you know if wow was recreated into in today's world uh what it would look like it just so happens that it um, it sort of made uh, uh, it dovetailed with the, with the with the Fortnite look when Fortnite came out. We we started working on Core even before PUBG came out, <laughs> uh, so long before long before Fortnite. In terms of key challenges, uh, if you were to kind of summarize what your top like two to three big challenges that you guys are facing right now, what would they be? Technically, what we're doing is super freaking hard. Super, super freaking hard. This is something that is not to be underestimated. I mean, you're looking at, a, you know, we are a team of close to 80 people. You're looking at years of, not, not, not just decades of expense encapsulated in the tool, but in the tech stack. But uh, this is super hard. Like uh, we've invested very early on on the, on the tech side. Uh, we're built on top of Unreal. But, you know, we had to build our own editor, our own real-time multiplayer uh, code, our own publishing layer. So this is something with lots of surface area, lots of complexity. Um, so, but that's also what's so exciting, right? I mean, it's kind of, uh, there is really not one week where we don't come up with a new angle, a new way to look at things, a new way to think about it, whether it's a, a feature, a way people are going to use core. And then you, you think super hard as a team on all that. And then you look at the community and you're like, oh, wow, they just <laughs> blew us away with one new thing we didn't think about or one question, you know. Um, um, I don't know if, Jordan, you want to... Even, even that, right? Even though it, what you're looking at right now, you're looking at uh, Jordan is in something called Core Plaza, which is a social hub that we made as part uh, using uh, basically all the games that were made on the platform or some of the top games. And even that skate park you're looking at, like that's something that was UGC. Everything is UGC, right? So it's like, sometimes it's made by our team. Sometimes it's made by our team on their free hours. And sometimes it's made by the, it's made by the community. So uh, what about the challenge in terms of, you know, I think you were describing it as the flywheel, but you yep. know, you've got a, it sounds like you've got a really great platform. You guys have solved a lot of great technical challenges. You know, so I guess there's one part in terms of getting uh, developers aware and getting them on and making sure there's a revenue model for them. But then at that point, to get the players, are, do, do you view that marketing as, as a challenge? Or do you think that once you have enough good content, players are going to jump on? Or how are you viewing that challenge? Yes. So the mindset I would tell you is not build it and they will come. That, 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 that almost never happens. Uh, and when it happens, it's, it's a fluke. Or uh, you know, it, for, for, for what we're doing, it doesn't happen. Yes, marketing, growth. Uh, community management, uh, developers relation, all that is super, super important. Uh, we're investing very heavily in that area. I mean, we, we hired a few months ago, Patrick Bickner, uh, who is, you know, I, th- I think has three decades in gaming. He was uh, part of Maxis before it was acquired by EA. So he worked on all sorts of franchises over the years, all sorts of games. So it's an area that's super, super important. I think from a, from a candid business perspective, um, though we are investing a lot toward the creators, it's very important. We have a very solid developers relations team. Uh, With the players, it's almost in some ways harder, right? Because you talk to creators existing or wannabe creators and you say, here is a smoke bog of stuff like come to the buffet, you can do this, you can do that, you can specialize or not, you can make games, you know, and it's, it's, it, it is not easy. But with the players, you know, you have to entice them, right? You're all competing for eyeballs, engagement, right? It's like 
you have kids, right? So it's 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 nine. It's you know let's say it's ten p.m. and I've put the kids to bed and I, I I've worked for another hour and a half on the company on Mantico and I'm saying hey now it's my time. <laughs> what do I do? Do I grab my Kindle? Do I go into Apex? Do I go into Valorant? Do I go into Core? Do I go into Netflix? Do I do something on my own? Do I do something on my with my wife? Do I play? You see what I mean, right? So we all understand that. So we have various programs to jumpstart the pump in terms of content. We have our own content. We have some creators we're helping. Uh, we're going to invest into a almost like a, a, a manual version of RevShare early on that creators can be incentivized and say like, hey, these guys are serious. Uh, they're already sharing revenues that we, we don't have yet because <laughs> we won't have the players. But um, so it's going to be a mix of all that. But by, by the time we launch to the players in a few months, we'll have you know, a huge amount of content of high quality of all sorts. And we and need one, to work on the messaging also, of course. Yes. And one thing I want to say about the content that we're creating uh, is that it's all available to our creators to use and borrow and copy and paste. The way Chorus create is made, this, um, what I'm showing on my screen now is a, a VFX sample level. You can literally go in and control C, control V. You can copy paste any one of these VFX into your game uh, and you have a high quality rocket trail or a high quality spell effect uh, by literally just copy and pasting. So all the content we create as Manticore is going to be available to our creators to borrow, remix, uh, you know, use as examples, all that kind of stuff. Okay. And so last area, last set of questions around the status and roadmap. So could you guys tell us what's sort of in the pipeline for the platform and what are like the key priorities in terms of features, capabilities, and things like that coming up? There are several areas in which we're investing. One, um, we're investing, of course, always in core for creators. So we're, we have more features coming into the service, into the client, into the editor, into the multiplayer, etc. for sure. Uh, more tools to collaborate. Um, of course, the monetization for the creators, that's a big part that we're building. The monetization for the players, so having a way for us to give money to creators and have them manage their own games, manage their own publishing, their, their own marketing, but also uh, for a way for us to distribute the money, uh, a way for us to take the money from the, the players. I mean, uh, get the money from the players, get the engagement. Uh, so we're investing also a lot in social for the players. Um, you can imagine like all the features I mentioned, like, you know, um, uh, 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 friends list and friends related features, one click joins, all sorts of, grouping, chat, etc. Uh, we're spending also lots of time creating specific content for the creators and for the, the players. Content meaning like games, right? So uh, uh, that, that's what we're working on. Um, obviously, you know, there is lots of work going on in the, in the back end, not just the back end team, but in general, like the back office, right? To be able to put core out there on different, in different stores, different platforms. On the product side, uh, we're doing a lot of uh, cool features that uh, our creators have been asking for, including uh, very easy ways to do NPCs, very easy ways to do foliage and grass and beautiful looking scenes. Like you can literally now with the foliage system make a beautiful forest in under you know a minute uh, that looks AAA quality. Um, so we're just continuing to make the, the, the editor side easier to use uh, and, and um, more full featured. Do you think that foliage system is going to be an issue when you go to mobile? No. Okay. Great. All right. So I think that's it, guys. Uh, thank you for your time. And do you have a message for our audience? Well, uh, no, first off, thank you very much. This was an amazing forum. I really loved the questions. Um, you know, I feel like my brain has been super stimulated. So that's awesome. Uh, that was that was really, really, uh, really appreciated the time and the forum, the 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 the, the opportunity to explain a bit more. Uh, super in-depth question. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I think my invitation is really to uh, the 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 creators and soon the players that come experiment, see for yourself. Core is in open alpha, so it's still early, but at the same time, it's still it's already out there, right? You can use it. You can you can come play the game. Like right now, you're looking at Jordan playing a, he's flying a biplane, uh, biplane game, uh, a biplane plane, sorry, over some forests, probably uh, 
in France or somewhere. <laughs> so it, 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 everything is possible with score. Come expense for yourself, uh, whether you're a creator or a player. Uh, that's really the uh, and and we have tons of tons of events and announcements in the next weeks. It's going to be a very 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 busy next months for for us. We're offering tons of things to the community. We're going to have game jams. We're going to have game design contest, we're going to have an externship program, we're going to have an art creation program and contest, uh, we're going to have um, even panels uh, to help people get into gaming and learn more about not just core but in general game creation, game development. Uh, so yeah, thanks right, for well, the time. Yeah, thanks and I'll certainly have all the links to where to download core and all the links to videos and stuff like that in the show notes but thank you very much guys. Thank you. Thank you. That was awesome. <laughs> Great. So um, when you first launch Core, this is what you see. You see sort of featured games, top games you can play, highest rated, all those things, discovery tools. Each one of these is a, a full-fledged game that I can click on. And if I click play, it'll launch me into a multiplayer instance of that game uh, running on Core as a service. But for the demo, I think it's really cool to create a game from scratch that we can play multiplayer uh, really fast. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to create a new game. And I'm going to start from just a blank empty project to show how easy and how fast it is to create a game in Core. I'm going to call this uh, Deconstructor of Fun Demo. Uh, this is actually a constructor of fun, actually. <laughs> our, our tool is a constructor of fun. So we will do that. So if you just hit play without doing anything else, you see you've got a third person sort of standard control setup the avatar. This is really about our philosophy of opt-in complexity. We want to give the creator 80% of what they want for the, you know, a, you know, sort of a standard type of game out, out of the box without having to write a single piece of code. This is multiplayer ready. If I hit publish in the corner here right now, we could have multiple people running around this blue plane, but of course that's not very fun. So let's add some stuff to this scene. I'm going to take a 10,000 foot view here and add a terrain. So I'm just going to generate a new terrain with our terrain creator. I'm going to say I want some maybe background mountains. Uh, so now I get some nice randomly generated background mountains. These are actually voxels, so I can carve holes into them and stuff like that if I wanted to. Um, and then it's got our sort of default blue material on here. So now I'm going to start searching in core content. Core content is all the assets that we provide as core for you to make your games with. So that includes sounds, materials, models, all those types of things. So I'm going to type terrain here to find some cool terrain materials. And I could have my game take place in the snow if I wanted to do by just dragging and dropping. I can also have it take place in the desert. So we'll do a desert here. And is then the is this is, is the kind of assumption like a 3D MMO type of environment? Is that the general assumption of core? Or if I wanted to make like a 2D game, yeah. does we give you actually templates. Uh, I started from a blank project, but we actually have template projects you can start from that do 2D side scroll or 2D top down Got sort it. of RTS okay. style, even first person and third person. Uh, nice. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna do a third person one here just because uh, it's one of the uh, the sort of default easiest one. Okay. Um, so there's a couple ways to make things in Core. I can literally just start grabbing 3D objects and dragging and dropping them in and scaling them, and you can see they got really nice you know high quality materials on them with you know bump mapping and all those cool features. Uh, or I can go to community content. I don't know if you can see that tab behind here. Let me hide my uh, camera there. So community content. Um, community content is anything that somebody has made in core that uh, any creator has made that they've decided to upload and share with the community. And it could be sort of a 3D model they've kitbashed together. It could be gameplay logic, or it could be all the above. So I'm actually gonna type sniper here. And what I'm gonna find is a construction kit to make a full game uh, called Sniper Alley. So I'm gonna go ahead and download that construction kit I didn't have it on my computer before. I just downloaded it from the cloud. And you can see what it is, is a series of templates that I can use to make this game. Every one of these templates is UGC, is user-generated content that a user on Core has made. Right, and this is UGC based off of art primitives of some kind that you guys have that have exactly. been mixed together. Okay. Exactly. So if I drag and drop the arena in, you can see I get a nice sort of arena for my 3D game to take place. Each one of these, I can select the individual object and you can see the, the individual yep. pieces that were put together to make this. Even these palm trees are not a single model. If we don't have a palm tree yet in core, we're gonna add one soon. But so this user got creative and made a palm tree out of ferns that we had. Yeah. Uh, got it? Okay, cool. So, uh, and I'm gonna go ahead and start dragging in some other templates. Again, all UGC. And uh, while I do that, Frederick, if you're still there. Uh, I don't think he's there, but. Oh, okay. And Jordan, just so I understand. So yep. right now the, um, the target platform is PC. When is mobile uh, planned or 
Yeah, it's a great question. We plan to do uh, we plan to do console and mobile. Um, and because we're built on Unreal 4, obviously it's not, we don't get it for free, but we, uh, you know, we, Unreal 4 does run on all those platforms. And uh, we will have video settings that you can adjust for those different platforms. Yeah. And in fact, you, we have to do that for PC anyway, because not all PCs are created equal. So we, we already have, you know, if I go into settings, I can go to uh, video and adjust all my quality presets. And right. we'll allow creators to also flag their game of whether their game, you know, if they think their game is appropriate for mobile. Right. But just to your point, I, I think I asked earlier in terms of mm -hmm. foliage, I mean, foliage, yep. in terms of a lot of bushes, grass, yep. all that kind of stuff has been a problem on mobile. So what, what is the sort of like, let's say I created a, a jungle environment. What's the yep. min spec on mobile that, that you have in mind? Uh, yep. It's a great question. Um, and a, f a few things. Our foliage system is built to take into account the the video settings and the distance, so you can you know you can have foliage drop out if you have a lower end device. Um, you know, it, I think of it's funny, but people people sort of often forget that the Nintendo Switch is effectively a mobile device in itself. And if you look at if you look at uh, Breath of the Wild, uh, you know their their grass and their and their bushes and trees are very high end, and it's it's just about how you how smartly you do it. I think there's also features in Unreal that we use, such as uh, object instancing the that our foliage system uses that makes it quicker to render. Um, so we'll, we'll allow basically the creator to say, hey, on a mobile device, draw half as much grass or something like that. Right, or just so, eliminate the- Or just eliminate, yeah, the, exactly, the, okay. exactly. So I'm gonna go ahead and continue making this game real quick. I'm gonna put in a palace here. Uh, let's put this large palace over here. And again, this large palace is something that was user created. You can see that these are just like cones that were put <laughs> yeah. in and, uh, so I'm just, I'm not going to build the full game, but I'll just do enough so that you can see. And we'll actually play it multiplayer with, with some people back at the office. I'll, and, I'll message them on Slack. And right now this is on PC, but you know, part of what I was thinking in terms of your target audience, as far as the developer community, are that a lot of artists are, you know, the, the kinds of people that don't have a lot of technical skill are going to be potentially the ones that are most interested, but a lot of those artist guys are on Mac. So is, mm. is there some thinking in terms of Mac support or are you guys, um, just going to keep it on sort of like, you know, Windows PC? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. Right now, the plan is, is Windows PC. Um, and it, it's, I, I would agree with you, and especially for mobile game development, uh, that Mac is, uh, for artists, is super um, popular. But more and more PC development, 3D Studio Max and, you know, um, uh, Maya and all those things are PC based. Uh, so I, I think it'll be, I think, uh, I think it'll be a good audience. Let me see. All right, I'm just gonna add one more building here. And then what's really cool is that I'm gonna add the gameplay logic too. So the gameplay logic for this game is actually just drag and drop it in. And I'm gonna drag and drop some atmospherics in. Oops, let me close this all. Get some nice atmospherics going on this and also the UI. All right, so real quick, I'm gonna test it. Okay. And uh, there, so the gameplay logic that I dragged and drop works. Um, let me see if I can actually even get the sound working for you real quick. Settings, I turned it down earlier uh, when Frederick was. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is publish this game. Uh, and so the publishing step is pretty easy. I go to publish game and a dialog box will come up and I can say, hey, this is a uh, action game, it's deathmatch. Uh, and I'm gonna take a screenshot of it real quick. That'll be displayed on the, on the page. Yeah. Now, what about like, so since clearly like one of the, the, the target sort of genres that you guys are going after is shooter, mm -hmm. but when we talk about different types of guns and gun characteristics, do you surface that so that you can, you know, like, let's say I want these 12 different guns, but then all the characteristics in terms of like the, the animations, the, you know, uh, ADS sorts of characteristics, the, yep. you know, all, all the, all that stuff, the physics in terms of the bullet drop, all that kind of stuff. Like how much, how much customization is there with respect to the weapons? Because certainly yep. for a lot of games, it's very different. Yes, absolutely. It's a great question. Uh, it's very detailed. Um, it's fully customizable. So all of our weapons are actually UGC. That sniper rifle that I just showed, and I can show it again here if I just hit, um, if I just hit play on this is completely UGC, including the code that does the, the aim down sights, the code that does the zoom in, that's all written in Lua. So it's fully uh, modifiable by the creators. Yeah. And it's even modifiable if they have no coding experience. All the important things that you mentioned, the bullet drop, whether the bullets bounce, their velocity, muzzle velocity, whether it's a, a 
uh, hit trace. That is all just in drop down menus on the weapon system. Okay. Okay. Uh, and so I pub while we were talking, I published that game and actually, okay. uh, I, I'm going to go ahead and bring up the web page here. So, and I'm going to close course. So you can see that, you know, here publicly, I've got, uh, whoops, uh, let me close that even. I'm going to close all the way out of course. So here's the public web page, coregames.com, DOF demo. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and jump into it. And there's already some people in the office, uh, I think jumped into that game and playing it. Uh, and I'm logged in with a different account. Oh no, hold on. I'm on the web page. I'm on a different account. Log out. Uh, let me just, I'll do it this way. Let me just go back to here where I'm logged in with the right account. <laughs> so if I look at new games, you can see it here. Play. There, so you can see I've already got uh, six or seven players in here uh, on if Ifrit, and they let's go find them somewhere. Now they are instructed to let me win during demos, but it doesn't always <laughs> work. And I don't know if you can hear the game sounds or not, but uh, I can't through Zoom. Okay, great. It's all right. That's all good. <laughs> let's see where they are. Oh, headshot. <laughs> They're trying so hard to let me win. They're so nice. Uh, but so this is, you know, full, full 3D shooter that we just created in a few minutes. Uh, right. Now, know, one of the big thing in shooters is like visibility of, of the windows in terms of the transparency and stuff like that. Do you guys yep. allow it so that that's different based upon the games? Like some games you want to be able to see through the windows, some you want. Yep. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all the windows are, you can put any material. You, basically, I didn't show it, but you can drag and drop any material on any surface. Okay. So, uh, and we have some one-sided materials. So if you want to be able to see out the window, but not in, uh, stuff like that. So I'm going to go in here because uh, there's a portal in here. And as, as you know, if you've watched the trailer, you've seen people jumping right. through the portals. Uh, and you saw that I was able to join this game just by clicking a link on a web page. Well, going through this portal is just like clicking a link on a web page. And it will take me to a different game that's written by a different person, potentially even running on a different server. Uh, so here you can see I'm in sort of a high fantasy uh, setting. I'm going to grab a hammer and get on my mount, which in this case is a hoverboard, and go capture the points. So this is a capture, a five-point capture and hold high fantasy setting. If you've ever played a Wrathy Basin, it might be seen as homage to that uh, in WoW. Uh, and there should be other players in here somewhere that I can kill. I don't know where they went. There they are. So we handle melee weapons and, and all kinds of things like that too. Oh, she, where'd she go? And this is again, all UGC. Uh, these angel statues you see over here were made by one of our interns last year. Okay. Uh, just out of individual pieces. And we'll go to one more game just because I want to show uh, that it's not all third person over the shoulder. We can do top down and stuff like that too. So what we've gone to here now is going to be sort of an IO style uh, version of Sea of Thieves. It's kind of a, a pirate game where you are top down and you're sort of trying to capture as much gold as you can before uh, the other pirates. And so in terms of the link that you had mentioned, so you could potentially market your game, right? Like with that link. So if you yep. press on the link, it'll take you to the game. Yep. So I could create a Facebook ad that has that link to yep. take people. Okay. That's, that's cool. Yeah, exactly. Boom. So you can see we, you know, we support sort of all styles of different games. It's not just shooters uh, and, you know, third and first person. We've had, like Frederick mentioned, people make chess. We've had people make um, Connect Four with physics right. on, the, on the pieces. All right, Squirtle's fired. <laughs> right, and so you said this is built on top of uh, Unreal. So yep. is there access to, like, the, I forgot, it's called Blueprints or whatever their visual scripting language is? That's a great question. So no. So one of the interesting things about Core is yes, it's built on top of Unreal 4 Engine, but it doesn't use a single line of Unreal 4 editor code. We, that editor that you saw earlier, we created from scratch in Unreal 4 runtime. So okay. effectively, we're just an Unreal 4 game that happens to have a very good map editor uh, tool set in it. And, but more than that, obviously, creation of code, gameplay code and using Lua. Okay. Um, but all this editor you see here uh, was written entirely by us in Unreal 4 runtime. It doesn't use a single line of Unreal 4 editor. Got it. And then are, were there any other sorts of, you know, tech stacks that you guys deployed for the core infrastructure, whether it's not like on the network side or, or, or otherwise? 
I'm sorry. Could you repeat that question? I'm sorry. So, so like you guys used Unreal. Um, yeah. In, but were there any other sorts of tech stacks that you guys oh. used, like, let's say Photon for network or, you know, any other third party sorts of. Uh, yeah, no. Yeah. So all of our, uh, every, all of our tech stack, and I, I could show even a, a stack diagram, but uh, if we have Unreal 4 at the bottom, all the rest of our tech stack is custom written by, our, by ourselves and by our team. Uh, right. It's also cloud agnostic. Uh, so it's able to run on any of the major cloud services out there. So if there's Does a better. Does that matter in terms of being, since you guys abstract that from the user is is there a reason why a user would say well i want to go AWS instead of Azure sure. or whatever? It, it's a great question. Uh, and we, we, we do abstract it. We abstract it such that they actually don't choose. We, the core system chooses right. for their players, which is best for them. So if, they've, if we detect that they've got players in a certain region, uh, we spin up servers on the, the correct cloud that's best and most cost effective for that region. Got it. Yep. Cool. So that's, that's mostly the demo. Right. I mean, um, yeah, it's really, really cool what you can create with community content, though. Like, if I wanted to set a wedding, apparently, in Sniper Alley here, I could just download these wedding props and have a wedding in Sniper Alley. Uh, nice. Uh, you know, one, one, one thing I'll show real quick, actually, if, you, okay. if you've got time. Uh, yeah. one, of our, one of our earlier creators was a, a fan of the game Portal. And he made a, a Portal gun, uh, you know, sort of an homage to the Portal gun in here, in complete with the, the physics and everything that you would expect, right? Uh, so if I just put this portal gun here and I click play. I can go replace my sniper rifle with that. Put a portal, put a portal. Literally any game on the platform now can have the portal mechanic in it if it wanted to. So I think you're gonna to start to see amazing things where people are like, what if I mixed you know, Mario Kart style racing with portal type portal guns? <laughs> like what would happen? Like things that you've never even imagined before. Got it. Yep, cool. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, Jordan. Thank you so much. Okay. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye.